class ranking. Um, and then they will have like such a low curve or they will have X amount of students who aren't going to be able to keep that GPA after one L year. And then so, so essentially your GPA is being stripped or there's a very good chance it's going to be stripped. And um, I think having those conditional scholarships puts you a lot more pressure on um, 1Ls and you really, I don't know, it's already a hard enough year without adding in the, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to afford this after this year? Um, thankfully, for those of you considering Mitchell Hamlin, they no longer do conditional scholarships. Um, and I don't think, I don't think any other schools in Minnesota do currently, but I definitely could be wrong. Um, sorry, I'm just checking my notes. And then life as a law student. Um, it's really not as bad as I think other law students want you to believe. Um, I think there's kind of this whole idea of shared misery and hyping up how bad it is because like, oh my gosh, look at us. We're suffering so hard. Um, it's really not that bad at all. Um, you, I mean, you obviously need to make time for like the things that bring you happiness and make time for your friends outside of law school. Um, you have time to go to the gym. You have time to, you know, have a part-time job if you need to for financial reasons. Um, it's really, it's not as bad as things seem. Um, you do spend a lot of time, time studying. Um, I would recommend if you can afford to live close to your law school or to cut down on commute time. Um, I think that's really helpful because then you don't have to, you know, waste, waste that time kind of behind your windshield, et cetera, or um, taking public transport. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think as long as you keep an optimistic mind, things really aren't as bad um, as it's hyped up to be. Um, obviously, once you get to like finance finals time, um, you are studying quite a bit more and finals period, which is usually like a period of 10 days, is kind of a grind. Um, most law school finals are going to be take home finals that they might give you three days or 24 hours to work on, um, which actually makes it worse because then you're trying to fit everything into this thing and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, um, when else am I forgetting? And you're going back through the entire notes from the entire semester. But I mean, I guess it is better than multiple choice um, and then just a memory grind. But uh, in law school, it's not really about memorization. It's just, so you're one all year, they're going to kind of teach you how to like think about the law. Um, and it's very like, it really changes the way you think. Um, and then you're kind of just applying the subject of that individual class. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then in law school, for the most part, you don't really learn state specific law. Um, you'll get that once you come back and start practicing in that state or whatever. So like, I can't really tell you like Minnesota, sorry, I heard you guys talking about the crim statute in uh, Minnesota. I can't really tell you like statutes just off the top of my head. Um, they don't really teach you that in law school. You'll get that when you go out and you're working in between the summers and everything. Um, so everything is very like general, like legally, um, you're going to be learning like more so federal law, if that makes sense. Um, and then something I forgot to mention for the admissions, um, the internet is a really helpful place for learning about which law schools you should go to. If you're trying to decide um, on Reddit, there's r slash law school admissions, and they kind of talk about the admissions process and help you if you've been waitlisted. Um, additionally, I don't remember where I was going with that, but uh, it's just a really helpful resource. You'll want to make sure that you're checking the 509s. Um, that's a mandated source from the ABA. So every law school has to report their employment statistics and salary statistics for their graduating class to the ABA to remain um, accredited. And so you'll want to be checking those for like several years in a row of any law school you're interested in, because obviously if like, 50% um, of their graduates aren't finding a job within the legal field from a graduating class or, you know, 30% of them aren't like um, employed at all or, you know, 60% aren't passing the bar on the first time. That's something you're going to want to keep in mind because um, you want to make sure your law school, I mean, obviously it's a very big investment into your uh, future. So you want to make sure that you're choosing a law school that is going to set you up for success. Um, coursework and curriculum. So every law school is going to have kind of a different set of requirements. Um, but for the most part, you're one L year, you can count on kind of taking all the same classes. 
as every other law student in the entire country at the same time. So obviously for those core 1L classes, it's really nice because there's a lot of resources and study tips and outlines um, on the internet. So mostly in law school, you're going to study through outlines. You'll start it in the first few weeks for each course. Um, and it's kind of just like you go by topic and then subdivided. You'll be able to find examples on the internet. And again, for all these 1L courses, um, you'll be able to find them on the internet and slide decks, et cetera, to study. Um, but for 1L, you're going to be taking like intro to criminal law, uh, property law. Um, you probably won't take evidence until like 2L year, or you just might not take it at all. It depends on if your school requires it. Um, you'll be taking like criminal procedure. Um, I don't even know. That was like so long ago. I feel like I've blocked it out. Um, some schools you'll take like professional responsibility, which is like your ethical um, obligations as an attorney. You'll take that 1L year or 2L year. And then after you take professional responsibility, you'll have to take the MPRE. So you'll want to be thinking about that as you're heading into 1L one or, one or 2L year is when you're going to take professional responsibility and when you're going to study for it to that like study for the MPRE. Um, Themis, T-H-E-M-I-S, has a free MPR study course available for people um and you'll want to take the mpre in time to make sure it's done before the bar um i did not do that so now after i take the bar in july i'm gonna have to sit down and study again for the mpre in august so don't make that mistake um what else oh so after your 1l year for most law students you're really going to be able to pick and choose kind of the classes that you're interested in in that you think would be most beneficial to you um so obviously like you have your bar courses the ones that are going to be tested on the bar I think there's like 17 subjects that are potential topics on the bar um, and then you're going to have your non-bar subjects and those will be things like child abuse and the law or national security law um, and that's more like specific and those won't be graded necessarily on a curve because all law school classes are graded on a curve which can be your friend or it can hurt you um, I mean, generally it's helpful though, but your non-bar courses are not going to be on the curve. So usually you'll be able to get higher grades in those. So I think taking a mix of those bar courses, so that way you're familiar at least when it comes time to study for the bar and balancing that out with um, those non-bar courses where you can relax a little bit more, have a little bit more fun with the subject matter um, and get a little bit higher grades. I think that's really the key to success 2L and 3L year. And it will help it not be such a slog because by the time you get to like your um, spring semester of 2L and you're getting to 3L, you're like, okay, like I, I get it. I know these things. Now I just want to go out and like work and actually put these things into practice. Um, that will kind of help like with taking those fun classes also help you figure out what you want to do with your legal degree. Um, thankfully, you know, there's a lot of options that you can do with a JD. Um, you can obviously work in like, the private sector, um, you can go in-house, you can work in banking if you want. Healthcare law is really big right now. Um, and I know there's like a lot of openings if that's something you're interested in. Um, obviously, like you can work as a public defender, you can work as a prosecutor. Like there are so many options. You truly can't go wrong getting a JD if that's something you're interested in. And honestly, you don't even have to go into law. Like just having the degree can be really helpful. Um, because again, it changes the way you think and the way you analyze. And it gives you a different set of, like, work ethic if maybe it wasn't there before. Um, so, like, I think if I was an employer, I'd look at it as a positive, as even if you weren't going, like, into the legal field necessarily. Um, there's also the options, not to, like, plug it, because I think it's a great option. But if you are looking at going into law school right now and you're concerned about paying for it or you're just like, oh, man, I should have joined, the Air Force has a program where if you sign up, like, for their, I think it's like DLP um, something, it's like delete legal program. They will pay for your entire law school, like education, everything. Um, you'll get a monthly fee or a monthly payment every month, um, including like payments for room and board, et cetera. And then you just drill once a week, I think it is, um, like just PT at like a ROTC, Air Force ROTC site, like somewhere in the state or close to your law school. Um, and then obviously like you have to join the Air Force as an attorney um, for four years afterwards. But 
it's just something to consider that most people don't know about. I didn't know about it until law school. And by the time I knew about it, it was too late. Otherwise, I seriously would have considered it because having a large amount of student debt is kind of, um, it definitely weighs on you thinking about your options post law school. Um, what else? Let's go into legal internships and externships. So thankfully, whichever law school you go to will have a program for um, looking for summertime jobs. So in between 1L and 2L year, you'll be kind of looking for legal jobs. Um, prior to the summer, there will be OCI, but that'll be for the following summer. So that gets kind of confusing because OCI is the on-campus interviewing. It's how kind of big law recruits. Um, obviously, most people aren't going to be able to get into big law. Um, it's just there's too there's too many people who covet it and not enough spots, unfortunately. Um, but it's where also like medium firms, smaller firms, local PD's office, um, prosecutor's office, they'll come and basically shill themselves to you. And you'll say, yes, here, take my resume and my cover letter. Um, and then they'll say, yes, we want to interview you or no, we don't want to interview you. And if you both match, then you'll go into like formal interviews with them. And if you they select you then you would go work for them in between 2L and 3L year. And usually that's going to turn into an offer of employment for after law school. Unfortunately, um, if you don't go to a big school like Harvard or Yale, there's going to be not as many OCI employers um, kind of coming to your law school to ask about that. So most people are not necessarily going to find a job through OCI. Um, I don't know a single person in my like legal cohort this year who got a job through OCI. But it is obviously like it was the most traditional way that people used to get legal jobs. Um, it's not anymore. You can use LinkedIn jobs. Um, you can use Indeed. You can use your school's platform. Um, Simplicity. Like all these legal employers who are looking for internships. Um, usually you just call it law clerking. Um, they're going to be just kind of hawking themselves the way normal employers do these days. Um, as for externships, where you're not getting paid and you are receiving school credits, um, that'll be for your school for the most part. Sometimes it'll be advertised online where it's like a law firm and they're like, oh, this is an externship placement. Um, those are a little bit predatory because then the law firm is really getting you to work for them, but you're not getting paid. And usually that amount of work is not going to be equivalent to the school credits that you're receiving. So I would recommend that usually for an externship, you're going to want to go through your school. And a lot of them will have clinics um, where you're receiving credit. You have a classroom portion where like maybe you learn something relevant to your externship. Um, and then they will also find the placement for you in those clinics and externships. So that's kind of nice because that takes some of the work out of it. Um, last year, I did an externship through a legislative and lobbying class at my school. So essentially, every week we'd meet for like two hours and we'd discuss kind of the intricate points of working as an attorney um, in legislation or in the lobbying field. Those are kind of two more alternative career paths you could take, obviously. Um, and then I got to be set up to a lobbying externship with one of the bigger lobbying firms in the Twin Cities. So that was really cool. And I thought it was a great experience, um, really great introduction to lobbying and kind of how that firm type of life works. Um, got to meet a couple of state senators and state reps and spent a lot of face time kind of at the Capitol and at meetings. So that was super cool. Um, Mitchell Hamlin, for example, also offers like health law externships. So like you're working in the hospitals, um, kind of in that legal sort of field. Um, they offer like PD, public defender externships. Although frankly, you can get such good internships where you're working as a student attorney in local prosecution and local public defender's offices that I think that would be the better way to do it because then you're getting paid. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally it's just going to kind of come down to what your school accepts and offers um, for externships, but it's definitely a great option. Um, I would just personally like to get paid for my work. So I went the internship route. Um, just kind of to give an example, like in between, 1L and 2L year. Um, I participated in OCI and all of that. Um, did a couple of interviews, but I was already working. I was working as a law clerk for a judge in Hennepin County who was doing criminal law. 
and then he switched to probate mental health so like guardianships um that sort of thing people getting committed like 72 hour holds that was super interesting and then after that like during the school year i worked for vln which is the volunteer lawyers network it's a nonprofit that gives free legal help and i did um housing stuff so people who have been evicted unfortunately and then after that i got my student law certificate so in minnesota you can practice as a student attorney. You're just technically supervised in that time. Um, and so I was able to work for the city of St. Paul prosecutor's office. And I think I'm not just saying it because that's all that my experience has been, but I think working for a PD's office or a prosecutor's office is a great way to get into the courtroom and really get comfortable with it. Um, most attorneys aren't necessarily going to be in a courtroom all the time. They won't be full like litigators, um, but I think regardless, being in court all the time as a student kind of in that prosecutor or public defender role will get you more comfortable in the courtroom. So you can at least see if it's an option that you'd want to pursue in your career. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of nuance to it. You are when you're working in these offices, you are getting cases the morning of and you really have to learn how to think and speak legally on the fly which I do think sets you up well for the beginning of your career when you don't necessarily know what's going on all the time. Um, all right, networking and professional development. Um, I'd say just add every person you come into contact in the legal field, add them on LinkedIn because you will have so many opportunities. Um, and honestly, that's a great way to keep in contact and track of the people you're adding at networking events. Law schools host networking events all the time. And if you join clubs like the Women in Law Club, um, Asian American Law Student Club, or whatever group kind of fits your needs and your wants um, during law school, they will host networking events all the time too. And a lot of them will even do mentorship programs where they match you up with an attorney in the region in an area you're interested in pursuing after law school. And I think that's a great way too because they know people who obviously are in the community and are hiring. They know, like, say you're interested in uh, construction law. That's a, that's a big growing field right now, too. Um, and if they know an attorney who has a construction law firm, then they could set you up with them. And that's another connection you've made. So I think taking advantage of the opportunities that your law school offers you is going to be the best way to network and create those professional developments, like contacts. Um, and again, if you're doing like an internship in like during the summer or you're clerking, um, adding those people and just being as friendly as possible, because truly the legal field is a very, very small community. Um, like no matter where you go, it's just a very small community. So safeguarding your reputation reputation is also really important. Even now, before you start law school, just make sure you're representing yourself the way you'd want, you know, your opposing counsel in a courtroom to see you. Um, because again, the internet never deletes stuff, unfortunately. So just making sure you're like treating people with kindness and you're being friendly when you're act interacting in like the legal spaces, that's going to be the best way to maintain your reputation um, and ensure that these professional development opportunities keep coming your way. Um, but again, it's really going to come down to kind of your law school and attending events and just being friendly and everything like that. So I guess I don't really have much advice on that front. So sorry. Uh, let's see. All right. Preparing for the bar exam. You guys are very far off from that. Lucky ducks. Um, but mostly, most people use um, Barbary or Themis to study. Again, it's not like the old days where you have to have like a big textbook. Everything is on the computer now. And it'll just be a program that will guide you kind of at your self-guided pace um, through modules. And those modules will address everything on the bar exam. Um, obviously, there's like a written portion with multiple essays, and then there's multiple choice um, questions. And then some schools will have like a setup with a specific company where your tuition dollars will go towards paying the cost of your bar prep program. Um, and then you usually can't opt out of that, unfortunately, but sometimes you will get um, a tuition refund if you decide at the end of your three years you don't want to go with the bar program that your law school uses. Um, so essentially you take like eight weeks after graduation, nine weeks, 10 weeks, however long you can afford it. Most people will not work during this time if they can afford to do so. 
Um, obviously everyone's financial situation is different, but if there is a way for you to not be able to work during this or only work like very, very short hours, like 10 hours a week, I would recommend doing that. Um, and then you just spend the entire time studying. Like it's your job, like 40, 50 hours a week, you're studying for the bar. Um, unfortunately that's just the way things are unless you go to law school in Wisconsin, in which case you get diploma privilege and I'm extraordinarily jealous. Um, but yeah, you just spend the entire time studying. Um, some law schools will offer bar prep classes that some people will take like their last semester or two of law school. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. A lot of people say it really helped them. A lot of people say it contributed to the burnout. You're already going to spend eight to 10 weeks studying full time for the bar. Um, I wouldn't waste like my tuition money on something like like where they're just um making you study for the bar and then grading you on that but that's just my own personal preference honestly um it's going to be up to everyone else and then yeah you just spend that time studying um some people take out bar loans um which is essentially just a loan to cover the cost of paying for the bar and to cover the cost of an apartment and all their rent and their daily utilities while studying for the bar I would recommend if it ever gets to that point, open up a new credit card. Do not get out of bar loan because they usually have like 32% interest, but that is an option if you need it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, what else? Let me see. All right. So career paths in law. So I kind of already talked about this a bit. There's obviously like the traditional um, law firm life. Um Law firms can be very general, like everyone covers anything, any problem that anyone walks in with. Um, they can be very specific. I know a guy whose mother owns a construction law firm company. There's another law firm that just opened in the Twin Cities that is simply for cannabis law. Um, so, I mean, obviously, there's every field you could think of, there is a type of law for it. There's like veterans, disability appeals law firms. Um, there's immigration law firms. Um, there's everything under the sun. So that's always an option. Um, and then going in-house, which usually can't occur until you're a couple of years into your career. In-house just means you're working for the company, you're the in-house attorney. So you're going to do everything that that company might need legally, such as drawing up employment contracts, doing immigration law for their future potential employees, um, doing business deals, all sorts of things like that, acquisitions, everything. Um, but it is quite a cushy job. It has typically better work-life um, balance than a traditional law firm. Um, and usually it's pretty good pay. So, I mean, that's always an option to consider if you are concerned about having to worry about billable hour requirements, um, like in a traditional law firm. You also aren't necessarily going to be on call all the time in when you're working in-house. Um, unfortunately, that is one of the drawbacks of law firms is you are going to have billable hour requirements and you are going to be on call for if, hey, say you're doing criminal law, someone gets arrested, they're calling you because they're going to have a bail hearing in the morning and they're calling you from jail. So you're going to have to pick up or they're texting you the night before their trial and they're nervous and you're going to have to respond. Um, so, I mean, that's just something to consider as well. Um, so besides in-house, there's also obviously working for a local public defender's office and prosecutor's office. Working for the government is very cushy, especially as an attorney. You'll never have to worry about working past your usual hours. The government does not pay overtime, so they will not expect you to be there. So that's really nice off the get-go. Um, the pay scale is usually pretty good, actually, especially for like coming right out of law school. Um, especially like in Minnesota, the public defenders across the state just got a raise. So now they're actually being paid more in some places than prosecutors. Um, if you can get a state or a federal job, even better. You get a pension after 20 years. It's really hard to beat that. And you're going to get raises every single year consistently, no matter your performance, essentially. And again, you'll never be laid off. It's the federal government or the state government. They have pretty lax standards. And again, no billable hours. Um, and in those government roles that aren't prosecutor or public defender's offices, you can be doing a range of things. You might be an agency attorney. So like Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has their own attorneys. Um, who can kind of look at environmental regulations and then they might refer something on to prosecutors for the state. So like the state AG. Um, in a prosecutor's office, obviously you'll be prosecuting crimes. So the police may forward something to you 
to your office, and then you'll decide whether or not to pursue charges on behalf of the county. Um, you'll also be doing like county advising. So the county attorney will advise like the county board of directors on certain things and attend like county um, commissioners meetings. They'll be writing um, ordinances, county ordinances, city ordinances, um, everything like that. So like drawing up business contracts on behalf of the county, et cetera. Um, public defender's offices, you'd be um, providing legal help depending on income requirements for your area to people who need legal help but cannot afford it. Um, also, they'd be providing legal help to children because when a child is removed from the home in Minnesota, they are entitled to an attorney if there's a possibility that they won't be returning to their parents. Um, so that's another instance where you'd be representing people. Um, you also represent people usually if they are having like some type of freedom deprived from them. So like, again, I mentioned earlier, guardianships, you'll be representing people in that instance, um, maybe someone who doesn't want to be committed to a facility, et cetera. Um, and then beyond all that, there's also, I mentioned earlier, all the opportunities outside of the legal field. Just because you get a JD doesn't mean you have to be a trial attorney or be in court or any of that. Um, obviously, there's like also a state's attorneys and wills attorneys, they don't see that much courtroom time, which is nice if you say want to have like a family and you have like lots of kids and you want to focus on your family. Um, obviously, there's going to be some legal fields that are better than others for having that kind of quality time. Um, and so like in, in a state attorney, obviously, it's just drawing up wills and everything. And if it's contested, then you might see a courtroom. But usually those things will settle before you ever end up in a courtroom. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many opportunities, like if you have a JD that, I don't know, if you can figure it out sooner, more power to you, um, because I think you'll have an easier time when it comes to graduating. The next couple of years are gonna be really, like really good for the job market and for just graduating attorneys. Um, I mean, obviously like the pandemic really hastened things up in the legal field with adding technologies and Zoom court, et cetera. Um, and most places it is possible to have a hybrid work schedule right now, um, as long as you like don't have in-person court that day. So that's really nice because prior to that, the legal field was a dinosaur. Like it was really bad, um, but it's gotten a lot better since the pandemic. But since the pandemic, all the older attorneys are kind of retiring a little bit earlier, um, obviously with the baby boomers getting older, they are retiring as well. So that's opening up a lot of spots in the legal field. And if you are someone who is interested in practicing in a rural area or working for the government or even just working in a firm um, in a place that isn't New York City or California or Texas, you're going to have a really easy time finding a job, um, especially in Minnesota. There's quite a number of open spots and vacancies, and it's going to be like that and just continue to open up even more spots. So if you're deciding on law school or thinking about it, this is a great time for that. Um, let's see, challenges and rewards of law school. Um, so I think like probably the main challenge is deciding if this is worth it to you. Um, most people who go to law school are obviously going to have a lot of student debt after that. Um, and it is something that I think if you are thinking about law school, it should weigh heavy on your mind and you should really like take some time to have some serious introspection and some serious reflecting and decide if this is the route you want to take. Um, most people I know are going to have three figures, or not three figures, six figures in debt, you know? Um, and that's really scary. That is that is a lot to take on, especially like when you are so young. Um, and if you want to get married in like after law school or anything, like that is something you have to consider, you know? Um, and I think you have to really go into it with kind of like the right reasons. If you're wanting to go into law school just because you think like, oh, this is going to be a nice, cushy career. I'm going to get paid really well. I mean, yes, eventually most people will end up in like a decently cushy job compared to the general populace or just people who have a BA. That's going to take quite a few years. Most law students right out of law school are going to be making like 62 grand. Like I think that's the median, median salary currently for like a brand new law student. So, I mean, yes, that's like a decent amount. But it's really not that much when you have, you know, six figures in debt and you are trying to move on with your life, you know, get married or buy a house or, you know, finally live like a nice life. Um, and it is three years out of your life. You know, that is a big deal. Um, 
people your age might be have graduated with their BA already and now they're getting to move on and do like all the adult fun things and you're still in law school and that is hard and it's hard to look around and compare where you are to you know your peers but I think if this is worth it and this is something you want to pursue then it doesn't really matter you know everyone's on their own path their own stage in life um, and it'll all even out eventually but it is something to consider you know um let's see what else if you are interested in the law I think it's a great field you know law school is kind of boring um, especially your first year when you're taking classes that everyone else is taking and you don't get a choice in it's boring uh, it's not fun to just sit there and read 160 pages of something you don't understand it's not a good time but like obviously I'm three weeks from graduation and I can say like it's been worth it because when you are working those jobs in the summer or you're working part-time during the school in the legal field you realize like oh I know what someone's talking about or oh I get to go to court like this is exciting I get to help someone um someone's having a really bad day like the worst day of their life and you get to help alleviate that a little bit um and so if you are interested in like public service or a career where you like to read and you like to think a lot then I think this is the path for you um again you just really have to consider your motivations behind law school when you're thinking about making this choice um but overall I think the most that most people who go to law school won't regret it um as long as you're you know your intentions are pure and you know what your intentions are with going to law school um in general other challenges I really don't think like <laughs> you'll miss out on your normal life too much though um I mean it is tough but anything worth having is is gonna be tough so I mean obviously you'll still have time to go to the gym you'll still have time to hang out with your friends Go out on the weekends, go out to bars if that's something you're interested in, um, go on trips, travel, hang out with your family. Like, there's plenty of time for that. So I wouldn't let, let that, like, worry you or distract you um, or anything like that. And, like, it really isn't that bad. Like, I mean, it's challenging, but it's it's. I don't think it's any worse than undergrad, to be honest. Um... I don't think I have anything else to add. Was there any questions or anything else anyone wants me to more go in depth on? Anything like that? Um, I have a question. Does Hamlin have any housing requirements, like for any of the years? No, no. Um, thankfully, once you get to law school, um, they do treat you like an adult. Um, I don't live anywhere close to Mitchell Hamlin at all. I actually, this entire year, I've been fully online for law school um, because it allowed me to save money and live with my parents. And I just got sick of driving to the cities, to be honest. So, I mean, I've been fully online and it's totally fine. Um, most law schools aren't going to require you to live anywhere specific, thankfully. How does that work, the online like law school? Yeah, so the ABA actually just changed their requirements so now you can have, I think it's 41 of your 86 credits can be distance education requirements. So because my first year and second year, I was an in-person student, I didn't have to worry about like, oh gosh, am I going to have enough of those 41 credits to be like a distance student my third year? So I didn't really have to worry about that. Um, it's usually like a combination of Zoom or just modules where your professor does a lecture and then like uploads the video. Um but for students who want to do like all online or something like that for their entire three years, um, you can do that through Mitchell Hamlin. I think there's a couple of other law schools that do it as well. Um, but I know specifically at Mitchell Hamlin, you would do most of your semester away wherever you live. Um, I know a couple of girlfriends that live in Alaska and they do this program and then they just fly in. A couple of people are in the military and might be stationed in Guam. Or Japan and then they just fly in because you do have a capstone week um, at the end of every semester if you are this full-time distant learner um, where you go to school basically for a week and you just sit in your actual classes with your actual professor for a couple of hours at a time um, and that's kind of a nice way to do it because obviously then you like go back and you have like your own modules of coursework and readings that you have to complete um, the rest of the semester but that's a nice option because it allows you to work mostly full time and live away from like law school if that's kind of what your needs are. 
I do have another question about actually about the seven sage. I went on it and I saw that there was like three different like paid things you could do core live or coach. Which one did you do? Um, I didn't meet with like anyone through it. So it must have been the first one. It was a while ago. I'm sorry, but yeah. it was just like full online modules. Um, I had another question. What did like a regular day look like for you in like your first year, I guess? Yeah. Um, so my experience is going to be very different. I started law school in 2021 and we were still fully online because of COVID at that point. So it was kind of wake up, have Zoom class, um, eat lunch, study for a bit, um, and then go to my second Zoom class and then be done with that and, you know, finish my readings for the day. You are not going to have the nice thing about law school is you don't have busy work assignments. You don't usually have any assignments at all, actually, for the entire semester. You might have a midterm, but a good portion of the time it's ungraded. It's just to ensure that you've been paying attention and it's kind of like a test for yourself um, to make sure you're getting the material right. So since you don't really have any assignments at all, you're just doing the readings um, and then you show up to class. And a lot of professors are shying away from cold calls. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. It's just your name will get called and you'll have to answer a question or kind of give a brief rundown of the case in front of the class. Um, thankfully, most professors are shying away from that now and might have a group of students who know ahead of time that they're on call for that class. Um, so that's kind of nice. It keeps kind of the, oh, am I going to get called on out of the way? But essentially, your first year, you're just briefing cases um, as you're reading for the week. So to brief a case, you'll just, obviously, you'll read the case. I highly recommend, and if you're the, to the gal who's going to law school this fall, Quimby. It's Q-U-I-M-B-E-E. -E. Sorry, just one B, two E's. Um, and that is a great way to ensure that, like, you're getting your briefings correct. So that way you don't say the wrong thing in front of the class. And also, if you don't have time for a reading on a particular day, Quimby will have all the answers for you, and it'll be your lifesaver because there will be times when you did not do your reading before class and you're just going to show up. And of course, that's going to be the one day you get cold called, right? Because that's just the way life works. Um, but for briefing a case, um, it's pretty simple. You just, however you do your notes, whether that be typing or writing it out, you'll just do like the facts of the case, bare bones facts, um, Jane Doe murdered by John Doe or whatever. And then it'll be like kind of the issue. Why is the court, why is this in front of the court? Um, can it? And the issue might be something like, can evidence that was tampered with be admitted in court or whatever? Um, and then the holding, and then the holding is just the court yes or no to that above question. Um, and then you'll have your analysis after that. And that'll be why did the court decide that that tampered evidence can be admitted into court? Obviously, that's just an example, but that's kind of how all your cases are going to go, your one all year. And that's kind of how all your facts are going to be. Um, and that's just how your notes will be written. Um, and then when it's time to collate that into your outlines, because that's how you study in law school, you're making this big, long outline. Um, you'll just kind of collate it into that holding, which is what is the question, and then the analysis. So it'll be like, can evidence, you know, when you're putting in your notes, can evidence that has been tampered with been be entered into trial or whatever? And then your analysis will be like, yes, blah, 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 because, and then that's how you'll be able to study, is kind of knowing what these um kind of facts and rules are and that's kind of how your law school exam will go as well it'll give you like usually in 1L it'll give you like the hypothetical and then you have to apply what you've learned from the semester to that hypothetical um what made you choose Mitchell Hamlin yeah so my other options were UND um, and Drake University, and then I got waitlisted to the University of Minnesota. Um, I applied really late. I wasn't sure if I was going to go to law school. Um, it was still during the pandemic. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but I chose Mitchell Hamlin because they gave me the best scholarship out of all of them, and it meant, like, its proximity to my parents' house meant I could live at home and save on rent. Um, and again, with, like, their very flexible learning styles, um, choosing to go online or not, um, it was just kind of a good fit. Um, and I didn't choose, UND was like my second option, but they had, I mean, full transparent, 
transparency, if you're thinking about UNT, they had um, an incident a couple of years ago and they almost lost their ABA accreditation. So I was just kind of nervous about going to a school that was close to that a couple of years ago. Um, and they also weren't going to give, since I was a Minnesota resident, they weren't going to give me a scholarship past the first year. And their justification was, well, you know, you can just become a uh, North Dakota resident and then maybe we can give you more scholarships, maybe. So I was like, uh, I'm not going to take my chances with that. Um, and then Drake University, which is, yeah, I think it's University Drake, whatever, in, in Des Moines. Um, I didn't choose that one because it was a bit more expensive. The scholarship offer wasn't as generous. And I would have had to move to Des Moines and live there. And then I would have been paying for my, an apartment too. And that was just kind of a lot of extra costs that I could save by going to Mitchell Hamlin. And the bar exam is fully online, correct? Like even all the writing and everything, like it's just on your computer? Yes. And it's your own personal computer and they have laptop um, chargers there, everything. Um, thankfully, but if you do feel more comfortable handwriting, you can handwrite it all, um, which is a good option to have. But I've heard that since it's so much writing, you know, most people aren't used to handwriting so much these days because so much of our schoolwork is on the laptop. I'd be concerned about, you know, your hand cramping up and your handwriting getting messy, et cetera. Um, and, but yes, it's mostly online. So Um, did you do any internships before law school or like, would you recommend any of those? Um, I did not do any internships like in the legal field at all. I didn't even really have like any experience whatsoever. Um, I'm obviously like, I was a first generation law student, um, first gen college student, like the works. I had no idea what law school was going to be like going into it besides like reading on like the law school forums top law schools is a good online forum that's been around since like 1998 so everything you could possibly think of to ask has been asked on there so that's just another resource to keep in mind um yeah i had no clue going in what to do um and again it was like covid so i didn't really have an opportunity for an internship but i'm not so sure it necessarily would have been like relevant at that point um because obviously like you can't really work in a law firm like until you go to law school you have really nothing to contribute unless you're gonna be working at like the front desk or like as a paralegal um and i do know some of like my classmates worked as paralegals prior to going to law school because they were a little bit older um and i think maybe it was helpful but it doesn't really translate over into learning like the law school curriculum so much it just teaches you kind of what to expect from post law school life um, so I could see where it would be helpful in that sense. But if you're looking at doing an internship um, to kind of help you with your applications or make sure that like the law is the right path for you, then I'd say that's a great idea. Um, obviously, if you can go shadow in like a law firm for like a week um, and you have someone who you know, like that would be willing to let you do that. I think that's a great idea. Um, just so you kind of know what your options are prior to going into law school. But again, with so many different career opportunities, post law school life um you know just because you shadow someone at a law firm and you're like ooh, that does not look fun you know there's so many other opportunities that are out there with your jd um but if in, you need an internship because you think it'll make your application stronger then i'd say that that's a, definitely a good idea and a lot of people will tell you that that's a really good idea how many times did you take the lsat once And are you prepping for the bar exam right now? No, no. Most people don't start the prep until after graduating, like after finals, um, which should be over here in like May 10th. So I have like a month before starting. Uh, it's just a little too, too much to manage studying and like studying also for school and filling out all your finals and everything. Um, and I still kind of have some graduation requirements. I have to get out of the way, like diversity hours, stuff like that. So most people don't start until like, a week after they graduate just to give themselves a little bit of decompression time so and did you say you have a um like online prep recommendation for the bar exam 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so most people are going to use Themis, T H E M I S, or Barbary, B A R B R I. Um, those are kind of the two most well known. There's others, but that's usually what most people will do. Um, some law firms, if you have a job offer from them prior to graduating, some people's law firms will even pay for them to take the bar and will pay for them to study. So that's that's kind of nice. Yeah. Any other questions? So. All right. I think that's all the questions we have, Erin. Thank you so much for coming in today. That was a lot of great information. <laughs> no problem. Um, it was my pleasure. Uh, it's a very rewarding career path if you guys decide to go down it. Um, and I'm definitely open if anyone has any other questions or anything like that. All of like my social medias, including LinkedIn, if you want to add me on there, are under the name on the screen. So it's pretty easy to find. There's not very many bursies out there. So Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank it was you. a pleasure talking to you all. Good luck at the bar. Yeah, good Thank luck. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Darby. Hi. Your sister was great. Oh. <laughs>